topic of uh, the specific topic of uh, uh, political history of Ukraine, ba basically statehood. But you know, in Eastern Europe, also in Central Europe, statehood has a, a lot of mysticism around it. So state as some uh, metaphysical entity with a lot of influences and subjectivity, agency even. Uh, in my case, as an empiricist, as you know, my, my philosophical background is in, brings me into the position of empiricist. Uh, I, I do not believe in mysticism or metaphysics, also following Kant in many ways. But today we will talk about how political system of Ukraine was developing and how it was connected with the political economy in a basically in this period of the last 30 years, which and this period of last 30 years, the post-Soviet period has already finished with the war. It's still a hypothesis from my side, but I think it's quite correct to say that with the war of Russia on Ukraine uh, since February, the post-Soviet era, the tendencies of that period has finished and the new have started. And in the end of my presentation, I will talk shortly about this and we can discuss it later. But right now, let me please share with you my presentation and we move on. So uh, today I'll uh, shortly review this, how the statehood, the political system uh, in Ukraine was developing in the last hundred years what was the role of Ukraine in USSR and how it impacted the last 30 years. And then specifically, what were the uh, post-Soviet trends uh, in Ukraine, how democratization, nationalization, and marketization were happening in Ukraine. Also, we will look at the combination or correlation of official and non-official uh, structures, that's political economy, specific political economy of Ukraine, which produced revolutionary cycles from one Maidan to another. And uh, then we will see how Euromaidan took place, how the Crimean annexation in the Donbass war started, uh, then leading to the current Russian-Ukrainian war and the end of the post-Soviet period. So I will uh, base my report today on these three recent books. Uh, one is, well, my book, which where I try to combine political theory and political philosophy to understand what was happening in post-Soviet, post-communist Europe and these dialectics of contemporary, of, of modernity in Eastern Europe is in a way a conversation and discussion with Jürgen Habermas. The second book was published, uh, it was written before the war, but it was published on the March 1st, so 20 something days ago. And it's a collective work studying the ideological creativity in Ukraine, Georgia, Russia, Belarus, and so on. So what was happening there? And uh, another, the third book was published last year, about eight months ago, which is the From the Ukraine to Ukraine, a contemporary history. It's a history of Ukraine for the last 30 years, which also exists in Ukrainian language. So if we look back uh, at the path that Ukraine made, it's the path that can be described as, as three republics. The first republic, it's more a general name for very different projects uh, connected to the February revolution in Russian empire, which have led to creation of many states in Eastern Europe and among them Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland. In Ukraine, the, uh, the independent republic didn't succeed. It, it was broken by, uh, in, in, in the this processes of uh, civil war in, in Russia. And uh, in co combination or in competition and the wars between different Ukrainian projects, everything finished in 1922-23 approximately when the Bolshevik uh, project of Ukraine has won and Ukraine was one of the uh, founders of Soviet Union. The second Republic, which is Soviet Ukraine lasted for about 70 years and uh, 
almost 90 years, and it was uh, uh, the period when political systems, political structures, uh, political culture was uh, developing and preparing the Third Republic, the independent Ukraine that started in 1991. It's early to say if the Third Republic has finished, we already thought that it has finished in 2014, but uh, most probably what we will see uh, as a result of this war, it's going to be a, a new statehood, a new state, and a new understanding of sovereignty. So probably uh, the, the Fourth Republic would be launched. But again, it's hypothesis. Well, within the USSR, uh, Ukraine had a specific uh, situation. First of all, it was one of the uh, USSR founders, so the Soviet Union and the Bolsheviks uh, of Ukraine were the, the Ukrainian Bolshevism has its own roots and its own uh, meaning. Usually it's uh, marginalized and not seen by historians of Soviet Union, but Ukraine had its own portion in the creation of Bolshevism, also in, uh, in creation of Soviet nationality of Ukraine. It's also the specific processes in 1920s when Bolsheviks experimented with the ethnic and nationalities pro uh, processes. And then, of course, this famous uh, Holodomor, uh, the, which uh, took place in the beginning of 30s, not the first and not the last Holod, but the deepest, which made a huge impact on Ukrainian society and political structures. Then during World War II, uh, we have also quite a specific history. On one side, in 1939, the World War II uh, started with the territorial growth of Ukrainian Republic. Uh, the Western Ukrainian territories, which are also Kresiv Schodnie for Poland, uh, were merging with uh, Ukraine. Uh, during the World War II, after 41, over 85% of settlements were destroyed completely. Over 60% uh, of population was lost. And uh, the nationalist resistance, which was collaborative for the Nazi Germany and the allies, uh, after the defeat of Germany, lasted in Western Ukrainian territories up until mid 50s. It, which also creates certain uh, impact on political structures and systems. The post-war Ukraine has gone through the period of reconstruction, resettlement, and uh, this reconstruction and resettlement when new populations were needed, when reconstruction of cities and industry was a must, uh, the clans have emerged. The groups of elites that were uh, taking care about this reconstruction have emerged into specific nomenclatura groups we, that lasted for several generations. And within a Ukrainian Socialist Republic, uh, this combination of clans was critical for the history of post-Soviet Ukraine. There were three uh, major clans in Kharkiv, in Donetsk, and in Dnipropetrovsk, which competed for the uh, control of uh, first secretary of Communist Party of Ukraine in Kiev and of the head of the Council of Ministers. If one clan would get control over the party, then the other clan would always be in control of the, uh, of the Council of Ministers. Also, this post-war Ukraine uh, was developing as highly industrialized, urbanized uh, country, uh, region. Uh, up until Chernobyl, this scientific, scientific revolution and scientific industrial revolution was booming here. But Chernobyl has made a huge impact on Ukrainians uh, and also Ukrainian elites understanding of what the science is, what academia is, and what are the risks from the science. Finally, when the, the Second Republic comes to the end, 1990, Ukraine is populated by 52 million uh, population, which is bilingual and by uh, At that year, Deutsche Bank uh, economists have uh, 
uh, wrote this famous report in which they were saying that Ukraine has the biggest chances for the post Soviet for, for the post Soviet development, which would approximately in several years bring Ukraine at the same level of social and economic development as France or Germany. Well, and it, this 1990 was also the year of free, first free elections into Ukrainian parliament, and it was the year of declaration of sovereignty. This sovereignty was based on the ideas of uh, neutrality, non-merger with any blocks, and non-nuclear uh, arms uh, territory. So these were the founding ideas for Ukrainian Third Republic. But this uh, perestroika that was already booming in Moscow, it comes to Ukraine in the end of uh, 89, in early 1990. And uh, this reaction of the communists uh, from the clans and from Kiev were rather uh, in opposition to Gorbachev and to Yeltsin. Uh, however, there was also a new force forming in Ukraine, in, in, which was also formative for Ukrainian Third Republic, which was uh, the, the Ruch. It was first this movement for the support of Perestroika, but then it turned the, into the Ruch, the movement for independence. And from this movement, new political parties of the national democratic uh, spectrum were uh, developing. Finally, uh, in 1991, Slowly, there, there was appearing this uh, uh, union of the national communists and national democrats, uh, which was uh, creating certain dynamics in terms of participation of Ukraine in the Union Treaty. Ukraine uh, in 1991 had three referendums. Well, one was not recognized neither by Moscow nor by Kyiv. That's the referendum in uh, Crimea. But the second uh, referendum was in March uh, about the fate of uh, Soviet Union and 72% of Ukrainians wanted uh, the, that Soviet Union existed and 80% wanted that uh, Ukraine would be a part of the renewed uh, Soviet Union, so after the new uh, Union Treaty. However, the preparation of Union Treaty uh, was broken by the coup d'etat. So several days before the coup was organized. I think there's a problem with microphone somewhere. Oh, several days before the uh, Union Treaty sign off was planned, the coup uh, have changed tremendously the dynamics. And uh, on 24th of August, already after the Russian liberals have defeated the coup. Uh, Ukrainian parliament, where national democrats and national communists uh, were allies, voted for independence. And this declaration for independence was supported by majority of Ukrainians, 90%, in December uh, 91. So already by having this, Ukraine participated in Belaveja Accords, that would uh, dissolute the Soviet Union, and then later in Almaty Protocols, everything in December 91. Well, starting from that moment, uh, we go through this period of uh, several, as I was saying here, it was going through the period of uh, post-Soviet transition which is based on democratization, nationalization, and marketization. If we look at the path of uh, democratization of Ukraine, on this graph, you can see how these 30 years can be described in the measurement of liberal democratic uh, component of demo democracy. So this red line is the democratization uh, uh, globally. Approximately, it grows approximately up until 2008, 2010, then there is a, a global decrease in democracy and many scholars are talking about the third wave of autocratization. But in our case, if we look at this uh, blue line here, it shows that uh, this decrease in, in the regional 
democratization starts approximately 2012-2014, basically around the, the war starts in uh, Donbas. But then we can compare with these two general lines what was happening with Russia and Ukraine. In early 90s, with the fall of Soviet Union in the end of Perestroika, there's definitely a huge rise in terms of liberal democracy in Russia and in Ukraine. However, after several, well, after approximately a decade of more or less liberal democratic uh, rule, uh, democracy is declining, steadily declining in Russia up until today's authoritarian repressive rule. In Ukraine, we have several waves, as you can see. The first wave is connected with the dissolution of Soviet Union and founding of independent Ukraine. So basically all post-Soviet uh, republics are being constructed as states in the wake of the, of the third wave of democratization. And of course, these patterns also models used for the state building they were uh, connected with the democratization. However, we can also measure uh, the Ukrainian path in terms of growing democratic quality or declining democratic quality. And we can see that approximately, we, we have approximately 10 to 12 years of uh, democratization and 10 to 12 years of authoritarianization in Ukraine. So we permanently oscillate between more uh, freedoms and less freedoms, although we have never reached the level of authoritarianism in Ukraine. Uh, the the post-Soviet, another post-Soviet trend was nationalization. So this, uh, if democracy was, uh, was of questionable quality and how it was practiced in Ukraine, uh, nationalization is uh, permanently growing. And it was connected with the idea and the model applied in Ukraine to unitary nation state, which had also some exclusion in terms of autonomy for Crimea, which was some sort of <clears throat> internal compromise between elites in Kiev and in Simferopol after the first, let's say six, six to seven years of uh, Ukrainian independence. But there was also inbuilt constitutional conflict. So Ukraine starts in 1991, 1992 uh, in conflict between our parliament and uh, president. President, uh, post-Soviet presidency comes from the model uh, proposed by Gorbachev. Gorbachev established presidential post in Moscow in order to get rid of the party control over him. Uh, this, uh, this was uh, also like, visible and uh, palpable in, in many post-Soviet um, republics and also in Ukraine where presidents were usually the source of anti-democratic, anti-constitutional uh, trends why parliaments were more about inclusive and uh, uh, de debates-based democracy. Uh, Ukraine have also preserved the uh, Soviet administrative territorial legacy. For over 20 years, I myself participated in many attempts of territorial reform in Ukraine, but we were failing. Somehow these uh, units, which were organized around uh, the number of uh, communist party units in, in Ukraine, uh, they survived the, the Cezura between the Second and the Third Republic, and they were uh, also creating regional clans, regional groups, regional elites. So that uh, up until today, oblast level, which was established many years ago uh, in, in Soviet Union, they continued existing. And also these separatist or irredentist movements, they were also uh, respecting these uh, administrative borders. Uh, it's also important to see that this nationalization included two types of decommunization. So after uh, the proclamation uh, declaration of independence, the real decommunization started when the communist party was prohibited. It's 
uh, its uh, capitals, its uh, budgets were taking, its assets were taking, KGB was dissolved or reorganized, uh, Soviet Union was uh, not recognized anymore. So it, and th there was the biggest wave of uh, like change in terms of the names and the statues and so on in Ukraine. However, there was a second decommunization, which was uh, the, well, that started, it was tested under President Yushchenko in mid-2000, uh, and then restarted after Euromaidan. And it had already uh, this, uh, the, the, the model of restoration of one ideological monopoly in Ukraine. So these two types of decommunization were quite different. The first one was liberal. The second was, was rather radical and unitary. Uh, and also it is important to understand that this type of etatism that uh, was in Ukraine, it, which was connected with the model of nation state, uh, it was also looking at state, at government as creator of the nation. So it's not the nation that creates the state, but vice versa. Uh, and also marketization. It's important to understand that the, the post-Soviet Ukrainians, like post-Soviet Belarusians, like post-Soviet Russians, were inventing a, a free market economy. And uh, Ukraine was a famous slow reformer, but even as a slow reformer on this, uh, on this graph, you can see that already by 95, approximately 40% uh, of Ukrainian economy were, uh, was pr produced by, uh, by private companies. And by uh, 2002, it was above 60%. Uh, if we look at uh, the GDP per, per capita, however, Ukrainian capitalism was rather unsuccessful. Again, these two middle lines show the Eastern European median and uh, global median. However, well below this median, the Ukrainian GDP per capita in fixed prices, and uh, according to the data that we have today, Ukraine have never reached this GDP uh, per capita uh, of 1990. Uh, Russia has increased it, as you can see from uh, this um, uh, graph. But of course, there's a difference in access to the oil dollars and so on. Uh, Ukraine, uh, since 2017, is the poorest uh, country. Uh, of Europe, and it's also connected with this political economy that was created. So you can see here on this different graph that after a tremendous uh, fall uh, in GDP uh, in 1990s, Ukraine was steadily growing up until the famous or infamous financial crisis. Then it has started recovering under Yanukovych and uh, this growth was stopped by the revolution, uh, the, the Euromaidan and the war. And another uh, attempt of growth was stopped by the uh, COVID. So uh, a lot of problems there. But another part of the problem is that the economy that was built in Ukraine was inseparable from the underground economy, shadow underground economy, inefficial economy. Uh, which uh, was booming in the first years of 1990s, in the first years of independence. Uh, so you can imagine the immensity of problems for the government to construct the, tax the proper public finance system, the taxation system uh, in Ukraine. So altogether, this democratization, nationalization, and marketization have uh, ended up with specific Ukrainian political economy, where, uh, which was abused by Soviet nomenklatura in times of independence uh, in privatizing the Soviet industrial legacy. Privatization was a source of primary capital consolidation. And these privatization processes, and as well as the 
processes of entrepreneurial revolution and criminal revolution were inseparable, basically. And by the end of 1990s, approximately 20 stable oligarchic clans were created. And most of them were under control of the presidential administration in uh, the second part of President Kuchma rule. Uh, at the same time, Ukraine was developing as pretty weak uh, peripheral state, dependent on foreign core and creating its own sovereignty and uh, even enforcing its own uh, sovereignty through the policy of the so-called multipolarity. When uh, Kuchma was looking at Moscow, Brussels and Washington DC, uh, and tried to create a certain equilibrium of influences. By, and by doing this, he would preserve his personal regime and also the uh, national interests. Uh, and uh, under Kuchma uh, in 1990s, this specific model of coexistence of formal and informal power institutions were created and uh, which was also transferring into something that is by some uh, specialists is called uh, grand corruption or systemic corruption. Uh, ideally, uh, we can look at the combination of correlation of uh, uh, the official and non-official institutions and organizations as if they cooperate and increase the efficiency of public institutions or decrease them. So they can substitute or compete with the institutions. They complement or accommodate. But in case of Ukraine, most of the time, only after the, the Maidans, after the political crisis, there, there would be some stronger rule of law, but not for a long time, this substitutive uh, logic was usually the strongest. Well, in the structure of the clans that uh, I'm talking about, it's usually an attempt of the group of elites to control some part of executive branch of the power, some part of legislature and some part of the judiciary. And these uh, clans are usually, uh, well, in political science, it's usually called um, the adopted political family. So these relations are strictly personal hierarchical based on the logic of guessing of what are the expectations of the senior of the seniors towards the juniors and how to uh, please the seniors and how to participate in this clan life. The uh, oligarchic clans have created patronal network based on personal relations and even something that uh, Balint Madyar and uh, a number of scholars call the mafia state. So this kind of uh, combination uh, is very specific for post-communist and post-Soviet countries. But in the case of Ukraine, we have a, uh, the, the so-called uh, model of uh, multi-pyramid uh, system, where pyramids on, on the top of each is a clan, but uh, there was never one clan taking over all the rest. So like in Russia under Putin. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, democracy or uh, its political freedom, some level of political freedom was created due to the competition of the clans between themselves, which created these spheres of freedom. So uh, this, uh, these competitions uh, were connected uh, with, with it, several uh, crises or two revolutionary cycles. Independent state uh, of Ukraine have entered into deepest political crisis in 93, which was resolved by early parliamentary uh, elections and presidential elections. So President Kuchma was elected and started this first cycle which lasted and ended in 2004 with the Orange Revolution. And Orange Revolution has finished with the rule of President Kuchma. Then in 2005, we see that uh, if in 2003, to, uh, if 1994, a uh, new president elected Kuchma starts new reforms, even liberal reforms, 
which created and established Ukrainian political and politi political system, even political economy. Uh, in 2005, uh, Ukrainian elites, uh, the post-Maidan elites, tried to reestablish republic and try to westernize it, democratize it, and increase the rule of law. But already in several years, the corruption have reemerged. The role of oligarchs has grown, and uh, with the financial crisis, democratic uh, attempts have decreased. So that in 2010 when we had uh, presidential elections, two winning candidates, uh, candidate Yanukovych and candidate Timoshenko represented two different uh, projects of authoritarianism. Yanukovych won with a little uh, difference from Timoshenko and his, uh, his authoritarian attempt was broken in the end of 2013, beginning 2014, Euromaidan. And Euromaidan started another westernization attempt that started process which it's not clear due to the war, this cycle has been broken, has been stopped, and we have a totally different history. Usually there's a certain pattern in these cycles, so revolutionary crisis and the promises, then the rise of clans, then the rise of one ruling clan that tries to subdue everyone else. And there's a resistance on behalf of civil society, which was particularly strong and growing in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, the oppositional uh, clans, which together overthrow regime and restart with revolutionary promises. And in these cycles, every time the role of Russia and role of the West was different. So, uh, of course, every westernization attempt was supported by uh, Europe and the United States and opposed by Russia. And every uh, auto autocratic att attempt was supported by Russia and opposed by the West. Then uh, in 2014, when this cyclic uh, development was changed, it was, it was connected with the Euromaidan. So Euromaidan grows from uh, economic problems rising after the financial crisis. And you can literally see that every day, <coughs> sorry, every year since 2009 uh, in Ukraine, there's a growing number of protests, uh, change of socioeconomic agenda for a political agenda and a growing role of uh, radical politicians in leadership of these protests. So that when we have economic crisis in 2013 and the uh, trade war with Russia, which was still under Yanukovych, uh, the uh, economic and social foundations for the protest has already been there. But the Yanukovych family started concentrating power after the uh, parliamentary elections in 2012. They were marginalizing not only oppositional clans, but also clans from the party of regions. And these clans from within the party and the, from the opposition started uh, supporting the civil society and political opposition. But this time, the Maidan has reached out to geopolitical conflict with at least seven attempts of creating the so-called People's Republics in Southeastern uh, Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian oblasts. Only two of them have survived, but for seven, since after the change, uh, after the change of government, that, which is not uh, in accordance to the constitution, Ukrainian parliament had to reinvent the power. Uh, Ukrainian uh, forces were temporarily inept to defend the country. So two uh, separatist attempts have resulted with the so-called Donetsk Republic and uh, Luhansk Republic. Uh, however, the, the rest of the attempts in Odessa, in Zaporizhia, in Kharkiv, they failed. Ukrainian forces and Ukrainian society reorganized and uh, managed to defend itself. And at the same time, there was an annexation of Crimea by Russia. And since June 2014 and up until March 15, there was a ground war where Russian army and the proxy uh, separatist combatants were used 
to fight with Ukraine. Uh, it has finished with uh, the, the conflict was frozen with uh, the Minsk agreements, which were never implemented and which were brewing this uh, insecurity for Ukrainian state and resulted again in uh, January uh, 2022, when Russia recognized independence of the self-proclaimed republics and uh, started the war on Ukraine. Uh, but at the same time, after uh, the Euromaidan, there were two agendas. It was also uh, in, in this graph that I was showing you about the democratization, you could also see that there was no democratic result of the Euromaidan. And it's connected with this inbuilt contradiction. So Euromaidan agenda per se, the, the winning agenda in uh, February 2014, it was uh, aiming at European integration, democratic politics, economic freedoms, decentralization, and media freedoms. However, with the war taking uh, place, there was also war agenda with limited liberties, patriotic propaganda, war economy, and centralization. And of course, in, in uh, the conflict between these two agendas, the uh, regime of Poroshenko had a very specific uh, dynamics. He was elected on the promise of finding some sort of a deal with Russia, but he was also, uh, after failing finding this uh, deal with Russia, he was heading Ukrainian resistance and Ukrainian defense. Uh, he was promoting association with the EU, but at the same time, he was promoting the clan politics, being oligarch himself, the, the, the the second generation of a clan of his family, uh, he established a certain shadow government where, where the seven most important clan representatives from different clans were participating and making the critical decisions later approved by parliament or by the cabinet. Uh, at the same time, if we talk about this clan politics, there was also a very strong movement on behalf of civil society and democratic groups, liberal democratic groups, which ended up due to support from EU and from the United States resulted with the anti-corruption system. So we have at the same time, this contradiction between growing role of clans and growing role of anti-corruption new institutions. Uh, the reforms that were very active in the beginning, in the first two years after uh, Euromaidan, they were hushing down. Uh, at the same time, this small war in Donbass were institutionalized. So there was shadow and formal economic processes and institutions uh, built and connected to this small war. Ideological processes in Ukraine were blooming from this small war. Uh, and this ideological monopoly was getting the uh, legitimation from the war. And at the same time, uh, the economic and socioeconomic decline was connected with unfinished reforms. You start something very painful and then you do not lead it to uh, the expected positive result. So it all ended up with economic hardships. And uh, this all comes uh, to the end in 2019, when we have the so-called electoral revolution, when uh, the very different populations, parts of Ukrainian population of Ukrainian society, rich and poor, uh, citizens of uh, big towns, cities, and rural population, uh, Russophones and Ukrainophones from all regions of Ukraine voted for a non-professional uh, candidate for Volodymyr Zelensky. Uh, and basically Zelensky had an empty program. He was a good guy uh, for everything that is good. This is why all these different groups, they were investing their hopes, ideas, uh, and expected Zelensky to uh, deliver what they hoped for. But at the same time, there was a common framework where these uh, hopes were uh, invested. So his 73% uh, his of Ukrainian electorate uh, demanded end of war. 
end of corruption and better income for the households. And uh, everything unpredictably or unprecedentedly, uh, Zelensky got uh, the power in his hands that none of the presidents ever had. He got the majority, one party majority, also in the parliament. So this constant competition of president and parliament ceased to exist. So for the first year, approximately from September 19 to October 2020, Zelensky tried to deliver the end of war, but he failed of finding agreement with Russia. And since November 2020, he radically changed his foreign and internal policy. First of all, uh, he started this more authoritarian rule with the use of Security Council. Constitution was put aside. Uh, he was promoting instead this very big and important social project, which was a socioeconomic project, which was big construction. Uh, his flagman uh, project that would create the legacy of his presidency. And then uh, in, in the same period, he starts very radical pro-Western foreign policy. He demands clearly and radically membership in EU and membership in NATO. And he was also bringing the issue of Crimea, not of Donbas, in the center of international relations and relations with Russia. And in February 24, this period ends with the beginning of the war, where Zelensky becomes this very strong and visible leader of resistance, leader that stopped uh, the second biggest army in the world, and who uh, created very strong support from the West for Ukraine. So I'm finishing with this slide where I, I say that this ongoing Russian-Ukrainian war has ended the, the post-Soviet period. <clears throat> and uh, at the same time, the plan of Russia for the fast regime change in Kyiv has failed. So in many ways, we can compare it with the, the operation in Kabul in 78, when there was this attempt of regime change in, in Afghanistan, it was successful. But nevertheless, even the successful regime change has forced Soviet uh, Union to launch a big ground war against the opposition and, uh, in uh, Afghanistan. And the same is happening in uh, Ukraine but with one big difference that the regime change didn't happen. So in a way, Russian troops have stalled. Uh, the, the, there is some success on, on Russian side, but at the same time, President Zelensky today is a pillar of resistance and of this uh, joint defense uh, and solidarity with the West. And if we talk about the end of post-Soviet period with the democratization, nationalization and, and uh, marketization, we probably see certain uh, three other tendencies, autocratization, de-Westernization, and sovereignization. And we can talk about it, if you wish, a little bit later. But now we can also look at the post-Soviet period as interwar period between the uh, Cold War and the new war in Ukraine and in, in Eastern Europe. And well, this beginning of the era starts with existential threat to Ukrainian state and Ukrainian statehood. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope um, if you have questions, I am eager to answer. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Michael, for this really brilliant introduction into political history of Ukraine during the post-Soviet period. I think especially here in Estonia, where you really do not have such an easy access to information about, about Ukraine, this is really pretty much appreciated. Um, thank you very much for that. So for starting the discussion, I think you have two options if you want to to uh, ask a question. First, you could simply raise your hand via these um, symbols in Zoom, or you can just um, print your, your question into the chat, and I'm going to read them or give you the floor 
to read them yourself. So go ahead. And maybe, of course, I just give the first question to Johannes. Yeah, thank you so much also from my side. It was a brilliant talk and I, I learned a lot. And um, yeah, um, this is very fascinating. I have two questions in particular. The, f the first one concerns this uh, prediction of the Deutsche Bank of 1990 that you that you mentioned. Um, so just my simple question is, what was this positive, optimistic evaluation based on? Uh, and what was the diff like, difference to other post-Soviet states, let's say? And the second one um, is also concerns uh, comparison. Like you've, uh, uh, it was very interesting to hear about this interplay of informal and formal structures of power uh, and the way they, they communicate. And you said um, that one specific uh, point of or one um, characteristic of the Ukrainian case was that there were like several pyramids, and that there were several clans con um, controlling. Um, Sorry, there's some kind of background noise. <laughs> yeah, anyhow, <laughs> anyhow. Ну, ты мне не сказала. Сказать, посмотри на меня. Maxim Burin, could you please switch off? Yeah, thank you. Johannes, I, I don't hear you. You switched off. Sorry, no, now you can hear me, right? Okay. <laughs> So, um, like different clans controlling different sectors of society. Um, and my question would simply be, I mean, the conditions in Russia and Belarus, let's say, in the 90s, um, the post-Soviet conditions, so to say, when it comes to these clans, surely were similar. Uh, what is the reason behind like this um, exceptional uh, or characteristic development in Ukraine uh, with regards to, to, to other post-Soviet countries? Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Johannes. The, the first one is connected. I'm looking at this report right now. I have PDF. And I, I think this group of um, economists was very good. They were very soberly looking at the quality of workforce in every republic, post-Soviet republic, uh, in a situation with industrial centers, uh, means of uh, communication, uh, and closeness to Europe. So they were predicting that Ukraine and four uh, Baltic countries would become very successful. And they, they are talking about reaching out to the same level as in France or in Germany. So they were looking at, at this as a comparative base. So in a way, I agree. Uh, they, they were all preconditions. But what was not assessed is the, the role of power elites. And uh, probably that's also a lesson for, for all of us. We can uh, see that the use of resources can be very different from um, who and how uh, uses these resources. So in Ukrainian case, this uh, culture of clans, as I said, it's connected with the nomenclatura, post-war nomenclatura culture. Well, we can look, for example, at the clan in Soviet Union uh, of, of uh, uh, Dnipropetrovsk. It had two uh, levels, one basically within Ukraine or the other level was within Soviet Union. And you know that Brezhnev was uh, one of the important representatives of the clan. And he was even preparing uh, the, the transmission of power to another representative of this clan, to Sherbitsky. Sherbitsky, who was first secretary uh, of uh, Ukrainian Communist Party in uh, 82, and everything was prepared for the plenum in December uh, 82. However, Brezhnev dies several weeks before. And uh, there, there's a very good description of this situation in Serhii Plohi's book, the, the Gates of Europe. But then uh, in, in Ukraine, you see that this role of Donetsk clan was very important, or of Kharkiv clan. But Kharkiv was too much connected to ideology issues, while Dnipropetrovsk and Donetsk were very much connected with industry. So when Soviet Union collapsed, ideology didn't matter anymore. And it, it, these were these two agglomerates of clans where the clan started growing. Uh, today, we see that the role of uh, Kyiv clans or of Podil clans is very important. They are very strong. 
Also, the, the new, uh, the new so-called Kharkiv clans, like Avakov and, and the rest is, is very important. And this logic of clans has never been uh, destroyed by any, none of Maidans. Uh, even more, after Euromaidan, you can arguably, arguably say that there was like reinvention of, of the clan roles. Uh, I myself study this uh, political culture uh, behind the, the clan structures. And I must admit that it was them who were learning from each crisis. In 1903, 94, they learned that you should control trade unions and you should take over the privatization process. After Orange Revolution, they understood that they have to control mass media and create uh, NGOs or gongos, whatever you call them, these false uh, civil society organizations and philanthropic organizations. And in 2014, they learned that they have to control also uh, a portion of, uh, how to say them, uh, entrepreneurs of violence, or the, the group, the violent groups, the informal violent groups. And they, they learn from each uh, crisis and they become stronger. However, this multi-pyramid structure is not unique to Ukraine. It's uh, in, uh, in a wonderful book, The Patronal Politics by Henry Hale, you see the comparison of monopyramidal or multi-pyramidal um, political systems. And, in, in Russia, in Belarus, in Uzbekistan, it's monopyramidal. But in Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, and Armenia, there are several pyramids. In Armenia, you can also see that this dominance of the Karabakh uh, clan, it, is, it coincides with strong uh, authoritarian period. And multi-pyramid structure today, since 2018, shows that th there is some, some level of democracy some level of uh, freedom in uh, the political system. However, it uh, undermined the Karabakh clan and it undermined the defense system of the Republic. So you see how this shadow politics and shadow economy uh, is vested into the sovereignty of a state. So if you undermine the clan, you can actually undermine sovereignty in uh, uh, Armenian case, it's uh, very obvious. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? What I'm basically interested in is um, some idea of, of interpretation of Ukraine that was very widespread in, in Western media about the division between the Western Ukrainian um, regions and the East, right? It's something that you can find almost in every German article about Ukraine before, let's say, February this year, um, where everybody seems to be very surprised because of this feeling of unity. Um, quite a lot of journalists never really um, saw this. Um, but how does the story look on, on the ground if you speak about um, establishment of democratic structures and so on? Is the power of clans in the East much stronger than in the West? Or do we have in the West, um, I don't know, some kind of autonomous, um, independent political democratic movements or something like that? How would you oh. assess this? First of all, this electoral division between East and West, it comes in picture in mid nineties and ends, uh, I think it ends with, uh, with the end of the Poroshenko regime. Already elections for President Zelensky show that there's mm -hmm. no big difference uh, between East and West. Also these reactions, when we talk about this unity in reaction to the war, it was also in 2014 and it, it's in uh, 22. It's a very different story. It's not electoral division. So you can look at Ukraine as 33 different regions or seven different regions. You, you can see different um, approaches of sociologists, of historians. So yeah, 
there, there was some period when electorally Ukraine had this Eastern and, and Western Ukraine, but it doesn't mean that it has very, that very different political uh, culture like East and West. In terms of clans, they, they exist, this, this type of demore, demodernized uh, way of uh, cooperation, of organizing power elites and social groups beneath, uh, it's, it's not connected with East or West, but in the East, you could participate in these uh, industrial centers. So you allocate much more capital and the clans in the West, they, they were mainly connected with agriculture and banking. Uh, Poroshenko is representative of a clan that grows from rather Western, from Podolian uh, clans. His father starts it and he kind of continues the story. And uh, he's very su successful uh, due to combination of this agricultural, then banking, then uh, during their successful development of the clan, they took over machine building, they took over uh, this uh, confectionery uh, stores in Kiev, and uh, many uh, industrial plants also in Kiev. So basically, you, you can see that the, the Western clans are as strong or they become even stronger in these days uh, now that the, the Western or now that the Eastern and Southern Ukrainian uh, parties are either prohibited or uh, self-dismissed, self-dissolved. So uh, today, uh, this inequality of clans, if you wish, in equilibrium of uh, clans uh, is in place now also. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, yes, if I may. Yes, Ksenia, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mikhail, for your very informative and fascinating presentation. I think that's really what most of us really need, this really leak best on the subject. Uh, I have a question concerning uh, the point that you made early on. And it's less to do with history and more with predictions. Uh, when you presented the chronology and said that uh, what happens after this war might well be named like this kind, some sort of a new governmental or uh, state type thing. W why do you think so? Uh, because like, do you truly believe that the changes will be these significant, provided that uh, Ukraine comes out victorious, which I really hope it will. Yeah, thank you, Ksenia. Uh, yeah, what, what I'm talking about, that th there were certain types of cesura. So the first republic is itself is cesura. It's, it's just generic name, because in reality, there were like over 30 different political projects on the territory of Ukraine, with uh, German support, with Russian support, with Turkish support, French, and so on and so on. So you can literally see many different political projects. And the Bolshevik project wins for different reasons. And uh, when this uh, project wins, it's already so, some type of cesura between the first and the second. So the continuity doesn't exist there. Then there's, there is some level of continuity in, the in this underground level and discontinuity on official level between a Soviet socialist Ukrainian Republic and independent Ukraine. This is why it's new Republic. But what we see today, it's this uh, cesura starts already in 2014. And I was writing and researching myself, and publishing on this, that uh, this injured sovereignty of Ukraine, when part of your territory is annexed, when part of your territory is not controlled and claimed by <clears throat> self-proclaimed republics. The national sovereignty is really damaged. And uh, right now, but somehow political system uh, in society adapted to this. So the, there's a front line created, there's ideological reaction or overreaction to this. And uh, you have increased uh, military reform, you have security services reform, and you have new type of uh, uh, power elite selection based on ideology mainly. 
And here, uh, it's already a very different situation than it was in the Third Republic, in the independent Ukraine. However, not radically. Right now, since the, the, the beginning of the war, political system works totally different. It's uh, a state in the war. It's a nation in the war. Society that we, we're talking about, the populations, is already very different. Imagine that over it's closer to one third of the population that left their houses. It's almost 40% of youth, of kids that have moved away from their houses. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you definitely see that those regions where populations were thaw, they are uh, Russophiles, they are not. So it's uh, the, the, the growing, we still, are in the process when the cesura is deepening. And uh, it's very early, uh, it is very early to say what it's gonna be, but I'm sure that the cesura has started and we will see a different Ukraine and a different Eastern Europe and probably a different Russia when this cesura will finish. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? Looks like we exhausted the agenda. <laughs> yeah, I, I I could maybe just um, because when 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 I listened to you, um, then I was thinking that this um, characterization of the economic political structure is a little bit well. That depressing to hear in a sense that what can be done about it can even a war change this kind of social economic structure is basically then probably my question um, because it seems that it's very deep there you described it goes back to the Soviet past um, to the post-war so to speak re reconstruction even right right um, so basically it, it, I don't really have a clear question. <laughs> I was just wondering, is it uh, Zelensky's clan forming and, and gaining power, or is it really a deep, deep change? But of course, as we are now talking in the face of, of war and not knowing the clear outcome, so it's, it's all kind of speculative and sounds maybe not the most important topic at the moment. Yeah, I, I would say that, well, first of all, Zelensky was not a clan person. Mm -hmm. He cooperated with different clans, and we heard this uh, discussions, but he himself is not a clan person. He does not belong to any political family. Uh, and uh, also that was part of the problem because if you have the clan, when you become president, you mm -hmm. have uh, cadres to fill in in the power positions. Mm -hmm. He didn't. He brought in power a new generation of people who were not ready neither to be uh, MPs nor to be ministers. And they were learning by doing in, in many ways. And thus we had a very problematic uh, quality of uh, public administration these years. And you probably remember it was in December in New York Times, this famous article saying how unprofessional the government is. But at the same time, this non-professionalism also means lesser involvement in this uh, grand corruption. Mm -hmm. So that, that's uh, part of the answer. And uh, in, after Euromaidan, we have also this positive uh, experience in terms of establishing anti-corruption system, which did not kill grant corruption, but it still created uh, certain dynamics and certain experience, positive and negative, that can further be used. Uh, however, yeah, there, there were also hardships because there were clans that controlled police or National Guard or security services or even diplomatic missions, and that's very painful. Uh, and then you also have this um, electronic uh, assets declaration system where my students and I we were going there and studying the taste of Ukrainian elites, for example, or how do you well, imagine that we created this capitalism that doesn't grow. Mm -hmm. And if uh, the, the, the classes, uh, classics of um, economic theory uh, of capitalism are correct, capital is the value that grows. 
So what do you do with uh, capital that doesn't grow? So it becomes a, a richness, богатство. And then you put it into something that does not provide additional cost or it doesn't provide the, the growth of economy. Golden icons, golden, this loaf of bread, golden pisoars and so on and so on. It's just an example of it. And it also shows how something didn't work. In, in, in post-Soviet constellation, if we exclude Baltic countries, but we add to these 12 post-Soviet uh, countries also six auto, uh, auto de facto states, then we can see that there is definitely a deviation. So the more authoritarian uh, rule was, the more successful it was in terms of uh, economy. Democracies like Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, mm -hmm. and Armenia are the poorest among the post-Soviet countries. And Russia and Belarus were pretty much successful up until recently. Although their uh, political economic system was also not perfect and it fails right now, as you can see, because it creates dynamics internationally, which undermines the economy. So here you see how all these dialectics of modernity and demodernization in Eastern Europe works and undermines our economies and political systems. Thank you. I was I was thinking again from my perspective coming from from Western Europe, right, from Germany, about the, the role of of parties. I mean, you haven't actually mentioned parties during during your talk, and I, I just wonder if there is any chance for the development of a kind of party system that would be somehow independent from from strong men or or clans or something like that. How do you see that? Yes, uh, there was an attempt of also creating public finance system, very transparent public finance system for the parties that win in uh, parliamentary elections. It's also after Euromaidan. However, still the shadow money were much more important than this public finance. Although it was a smart way to do. So you, you create a source of funding for the party that would need to make this party independent of uh, economic, well, of, of clans. It didn't happen so, so far, but maybe in future. And in the beginning of 90s, these uh, parties, I, I myself was participant of several, Democratic Party of Ukraine in early 90s, uh, they were also independent of uh, clans. The clans themselves were just inventing themselves. So in Ukraine, you, you have very rich political party system. But since mid 90s, these parties were just uh, a faction of a clan rather than an independent force. And again, uh, we have to learn from the negative and positive experiences and at the moment when the probably the, the fourth uh, Ukrainian Republic is formed this one, uh, the, the independence of political parties from uh, economic sources, from clans is hugely important. Thank you. Um, okay, Johannes. Uh, yes, one more question. Um, you mentioned that you uh, and your students uh, studied uh, the tastes of the rich or the elite, uh, for example, in Ukraine. It's a bit of a suggestive question, but uh, can you uh, comment a bit on how you proceed and how you study, um, how you get into these structures and how you make your observations uh, studying the, the Ukrainian elite? I think this is very interesting. It's pretty much easy. I, I didn't check it after the beginning of the war, but the, the last year we did this exercise. You go there and you have access to over 1 million persons from these highest ranks of public service, judges, politicians, uh, who put there their declarations. And then you see the structure of the capital, what, how the ownership is created. And uh, well, you see there all, all the time. So how much do you have in cash at your home? You suddenly see. And, you know, anecdotically, you know, uh, 
about these machines going through the border in on February 24, 25 with huge loads of cash. Also, clans were saving their incomes through, through doing this. Or, uh, but it's not only cash, what is on bank accounts. So something, that, what is on the bank account, it works for economy. So we, here it's, it's fine, but if you have millions at home in cash, it creates a question, or why do you need it? What for do you need it? Uh, then the second question, what else, how else do you, do you preserve and how uh, a public official that earns, let's say, $100,000 a year can own a Maybach for $500,000? So th these questions, uh, th that's exactly where the, 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 the system of these declarations, public declara declarations, should have uh, opened this, this shadow economy and, and clan structure. However, uh, the use of analytical tools was very strange. Uh, so we, we have an institution, we have a database, but the analytical tool that was created by UNDP, it was never uh, applied. There was another analytical tool created by security services, which worked slowly and only in a very strange manner. So application. So you can create very good system, but then you need cutters able to do it. And if uh, clans own the best cutters and also they promote this, uh, the so-called negative selection process. So you grow only if you, have, you are, uh, how they call it, you have compromise on yourself. If, if your seniors in the clan can control you through this compromise then, um, you can grow, you can be trusted within the clan. You definitely, there's a quality assurance of these cutters, but then when they appear in the public institutions, they act in this uh, specific manner uh, according to this uh, matrix that they show. Remember, substitutive or competitive way, yeah. Thank you. Um, at the moment, I don't see any more questions. Um, this is the last call, so to say. If there are anything to ask, you can ask Michael now. If not, then again, it was a pleasure to have you here. And I think it was a really good start for this series we just opened with Johannes. Next week, we are going to speak a bit more about the um, development of civil society in Ukraine. And I think your, your presentation really gave us the needed introduction into the overall structure of, U U of Ukrainian statehood. Thank, Thank you very you much. Justin. Thank you, Uku. Thank you, Hannes, friends. And let's stay in touch. Thank you. Goodbye. Stay in touch. And if we are going to- um, Thank you so much, Gisele. If you're going to upload your presentation, we can we, we give you the link. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.